Welcome to Ops 107 Hybrid as a Management Plane. Let's get into it. Hi, and welcome to this IT Ops Talk. My name's Oren Thomas. I'm a Principal Cloud Advocate. I've got Sonia Cuff, who's a Senior Cloud Advocate. And with us right now, we have Jeff Woolsey, who's a Principal Program Manager, Hybrid Cloud at Microsoft. And we're going to have a wide-ranging discussion about Hybrid Cloud. Thank you very much, Oren. Thank you very much, Sonia. It's really a pleasure to be here. So, you know, when you reached out to me to have this conversation, um, I was really excited because there's a lot there's a lot of things going on right now in the world of hybrid cloud, but there's so much change happening. And let's you know, we let's put aside we know what's going on right now, you know, worldwide with with COVID and how we're coping with that. There's also the change of what's going on for IT is under you know lots of different stresses. Obviously, they've been supporting their organizations, they've been supporting their businesses. They've had to probably change a little bit how they allocate their time to make sure that you know what folks can access the things that they need remotely. They still need to be able to provision resources, grow the business, grow their organization, deal with break fix. And it's a huge challenging time that a lot of our IT professionals um, and, and MVPs and partners around the world have been going through. So the first thing I just wanted to start off with is just a huge kudos to every one of you that's out there right now, you know, working for your organization, whether it's you're working at home, whether you're working in a Starbucks, wherever you can get Wi-Fi, we know that people are working in really challenging situations right now and they are being successful and they are helping their organization, they're helping their colleagues, they're helping their coworkers, they're helping their customers be successful during this, this really challenging time. And Sonia and Oren, I'm sure you've had, you know, lots of similar conversations with customers where they're going to this, going through this, and they're, they're kind of reaching out going, how are other people doing this? You know, how are people dealing with all of these challenges? And Oren, you look like you want to say something, yeah. Well. A lot of people are dealing with it very well in an ad hoc manner. That is, they you know, one of the weird things about an IT pro career, or maybe any career, is that a lot of it's just firefighting and it's dealing with the monster that's in front of you instead of worrying about the monster that's down the hall, to use a Dungeons and Dragons analogy. And um, I think that we've always been in a position that we are get we are very good at dealing with the immediate, with an eye on where we're meant to be going. And I think with this everybody's able to sit there and go, oh, we need to deal with this next and we need to deal with this next and we can see what the, the challenges are. And I think that the workforces that we're often dealing with, especially when this started, were a bit forgiving on how do you get this all together and everything started to work and then people adapted to the reality of what it was and adjustments have been made along the way. But we're certainly not paralysed in fear where it's like things have changed, we don't know what to do. It's like things have changed, we'll figure it out. And that's what the, the role is. Yeah, well, well we haven't had the luxury of being paralysed and not doing anything, right? I had a really good conversation with Mark Anderson, the National Security Officer for Microsoft Australia, and we were talking about a lot of the objections about working remotely or going to cloud had to be put aside because businesses needed to be able to, to function and operate. It wasn't this pie-in-the-sky project anymore. It was an immediate business need, and the, the cost of not doing something, um, it just wasn't worth it. So everybody ad adapted pretty quickly and organizations are now in this phase where they are trying to figure out where to next they've done all the immediate stuff you know things haven't gone back completely to how they used to be and so how do you plan for what the future looks like next it, it's still a bit uncertain but there's also a bit of a pause and reflect now and go okay so when we were in that response mode and we put in all these things did we do them the most in the most secure way like to the best of our abilities we got the functions up and running for the business that's great but it, there is also a bit of a time now to go back and make sure that all the little boxes are ticked in terms of mm -hmm. you know security and configurations and just make sure that the house is still locked up nice and tightly before we uh, we carry on evolving with this and and you, you you actually asked a very good question in there which was where to next yeah and and that was kind of one of the things that really kind of 
when, when you asked me what to have this conversation, it kind of got me thinking about these conversations that I had with Jeffrey Snover. Um, Jeffrey Snover, just spectacular person, the, the creator of PowerShell, um, a, a, te a, a technology that everybody uses. But I remember when nobody used it, when it was brand new. And part of, part of one of the things I wanted to have the conversation about today, which was, you know, 10 years ago, I remember Jeffrey Snover and I, we basically said, look, we, we have got to get the word out on PowerShell. We've got to get the work on automation. This is a fundamental technology. And most importantly, it's a critical tool that every IT pro is going to need in their toolbox. And now the question becomes, you know, that was 10 years ago. And, and spoiler alert, you know, we added thousands and thousands upon thousands of commandlets. PowerShell is now ubiquitous. It's kind of everywhere. It's growing. PowerShell's up to version 7. We're doing lots of different things, growing automation. But it, it's just this incredible tool in the toolbox. Well, now the question becomes, well, where to now? And where are we going? And what are what are those critical tools that people need to understand? Where do they need to invest their time? But there's also one other thing, which is, as customers have been, you know, dealing with the challenges that they have, I have spoken to some customers who said, you know what, we've also been our, our our management has also told us, you know, we know we have some critical technical debt that we've been putting off. Now is a fantastic time for us to do that. And so one of the things I have been pushing, and I've been evangelizing this a lot on my, my, my social, my Twitter feed, quite honestly, is, is, is a super basic one, but it is the criticality of the domain controller. And I, it's really funny. I, people have, you know, there's a lot of folks that have been doing this for a long time, and they go, of course, we know how important the domain controller is. <laughs> but for folks that have been doing this for 10 or 20 years, you may get that. But there's a lot of folks that are new to IT that don't really understand. And they're still managing a really, really legacy domain controller. And they don't understand that actually DC is critical infrastructure and that it handles so much. It's authentication, it's logging in, it's checking permissions, um, it's assigning and enforcing security policies, it's actually handling time synchronization, it's all of those things. And so I, I've been, you know, very much telling people it's time to also, you know, it's important to understand some of these critical roles and and and, and features and capabilities within your organization. You know, I've been telling everyone as a best practice, everything your your DC, every DC you own should be on 2016 or later. Period, bar none. This is, you know, this is one of those you 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 shouldn't even be thinking about anything even previous to 2016. And there are so many reasons for that. Um, if you look at security and the work that we have done in Windows Server and raising the bar on security, you know. 2016 was really a watershed release with the work that we did to really add next generation level of protections throughout the operating system. Credential guard, remote credential guard. You know, there are, there are some tricky security issues like pass the hash, pass the ticket that have been around for quite some time. The bad guys have been out there raising the game, working to steal credentials so that they're not hacking into an organization. They're using legitimate names and passwords to get in there. And Credential Guard, Remote Credential Guard had ad added new defenses to actually protect against those. One of and the so, big challenges for yes. I think a lot of people in the IT Pro role is especially once you've, you, a lot of us have been, an interesting stat about IT Pros is the average IT Pro is middle-aged. And so a lot of people have been working with, for example, and I ask this question when I'm presenting, I say, how many people have been, you know, working with Windows Server since NT4 or 2000? And you'll get 80% of the hands will go up. Now, one of the real big challenges is that we sit there and sometimes we focus on what's brand new. So someone's like, what should I be learning? Should I be learning Kubernetes? Should I be learning, um, should I be learning about containers? Should I be learning about um, Azure File Sync? Should I be learning about Azure Arc? But one of the other things that you kind of have to do with your career is that you sometimes have to go back and look at the stuff that you think you know and see what improvements have been made. And one of the things I've always found when I'm talking about Windows Server is I'll be talking to people that have been using Windows Server for more than two decades. And I go, OK, let's talk about how you harden a domain controller or let's talk about how you harden the domain. And I'll start going through features 
And there is an almost, I know this, so I haven't learned anything more about it. So even though you've deployed the 2016 or the 2019 domain controller, you're still managing it like a 2003 domain controller. So something else to think about in terms of your IT career in a hybrid world is, okay, so what technology improvements have actually occurred to the operating system so that I understand that I'm using this operating system as efficiently as possible. It's sort of like getting into a brand new car and then never using cruise control, never using sort of radar, you never using lane assist and things like that because people don't know about it because they they sit there and go, oh, I've got to concentrate on the new and shiny, not realising I've also got to look at the improvements to the, the tried and tested. Yes. And this this is a good example of where we've taken, you know, some of the technologies we we created. I know I, I know you've chatted with Ben Armstrong. Um, we've taken chatted. We've taken technologies like Hyper V, and extended it far beyond just virtualization. You know, vir virtualization in Hyper V was really just the, the kicking off point with what we did way back in 08 and 08 R2. But when we take it into 16 and 19 and the things that we did around Credential Guard, remote Credential Guard, hypervisor-based security, this is where we took this technology to the next level to create and, that, that next and, level of defenses. And one of the things that people who haven't necessarily paid attention to aren't even aware of what this technology does or how it works. Sometimes I'll just hear the name and they won't realise, look, what we've done is we've used virtualization to partition off parts of the operating system almost as though they're sitting in separate virtual machines so that if part of one part of the operating system is compromised, the other part isn't. And mm -hmm. they hear these names, Credential Guard, what does that mean? Oh, is it just like a, a name of something or like is it a different way of encrypting the data? No, it's actually a way of making sure that this bit can't touch this bit because it doesn't have the integrity to touch this bit. Yeah, we're actually compart compartmentalizing kernel code so that all of a sudden now, you know, kernel access, you know, a, a badly written driver or some you know malformed code or something that you know guess what you happen to open up an attachment and it's doing bad things all of a sudden doesn't have full complete access to the kernel because we've actually compartmentalized secrets and and things like that. So I think one I think one of the challenges though is mm -hmm. that Active Directory has been a victim of its own success in terms of it was one of those things that you put into an organization and as long as you kept an eye on things like the replication it always just worked and there is this hold back of when an IT pro has a look at all the things they've got to do in their day and the things that are actually on fire, if those servers are sitting there and they're still just working, how do you convince an organization to do upgrades, to, to upgrade those, those servers? And we've seen more success with people getting off server 2008 and, and 2002, for example, when we said, look, it, it's now end of life, we're not going to throw any more security patches at it. And it, it's one of those things, it's almost like being the blue team, right? It's, it's frustrating sometimes to actually get the buy-in, to get the time and the budget to go and do these things that you know need doing. You know that the organization's overall security posture would be improved if you upgraded those operating system versions. But sometimes it takes that big fire or that, that big security event for someone to go, yeah, we should have, or yeah, we need to do it. And you don't see a lot of those in, in organizations. I think that's one of the challenges that IT pros have is getting the buy-in and the sponsorship or how do they tell an organization that this really actually is super important that we get off these older versions so that we are in a better security position. Yes. And another thing, and, and this is uh, something that probably you're one of the few people in the world that can answer, Jeff. So we get a new version of Windows Server, or for example, we'll say 2019, or we'll go with just 2019. Now, there's all of these features that can be turned on that can make it hyper secure. And we want people to go and do that. But one of the choices that you need to make sort of in your particular role is which ones of these do we turn on by default? And which ones do we leave? Because we know that if we just tell people, go and put 2019 there, it'll reach a baseline level of secure. But we also know that you can make Windows Server an order of magnitude more secure, but that you have to go and do a lot of legwork. So how do you decide or how do you get into the position of deciding this is something that we're going to enforce from the get-go versus this is stuff where we need to make you get out and walk. 
You know, that's a great answer. And there's a couple couple different ways we're thinking about it and looking about it. One, there's always there's there's always this tug and push and pull about security versus compat. And there's always this concern that oh we're going to someone's going to enable something and we're going to break something. Um, it's it's why when it comes to Active Directory, someone will say, well, you know, I'm afraid I'm afraid to deploy 2016 because the domain functional level is going to change and it's going to break anything. Um, I, I had a nice long chat with a whole bunch of people that have been doing AD for a very very long time. I said, guys, how many times did it actually break anything? And everyone kind of sat there and kind of scratched their head and were like, it doesn't really happen. We generally add new things. We add new functionality. So guess what? We do that with, and we do this after lots of extensive testing, both internally and with customers. And what we're doing is raising the bar without impacting Compat. At the same time, we know, you know, that there are some folks that, you know, have highly regulated environments. I'll give you one example, hospitals. And so they always push back because, you know, someone gave them an application 15 years ago that was configured in some way and they, you know, they're, they're especially sensitive. And of course, if it's a, spe a, a specific medical piece of uh, device, it can be a challenge. So what we have, we, we do, you know, put in the different policies in place so that someone can say, look, here's a, here's a, here's a raised security baseline. Go with this. Or, in fact, if you look at what we're doing in Azure policy as well, we're also raising the bar by providing these new policies through Azure policy that will be able to be pushed down through ARC. And this is part of one of the things I want us to get thinking about is because today these days, you know, we have lots of folks that are doing stuff the way they've been doing it because that's how we've been doing it for the last 10 years and the last 15 years. Um, I had a call, I'm not kidding, with a customer just a few weeks ago where they were asking me all sorts of weird questions about security. And I finally had to stop and I said, wait a minute, wait a minute, explain to me why you're asking me all these questions about deployment and reg keys and stuff like that. And they basically got to the point where they said, look, we had this person that used to work for the organization and we always deployed servers and we always ran this guy's script and this script would harden the server um, and we wanna make sure it doesn't break it. And I said, well, where is this person? And he's like, well, he doesn't work here anymore. Like, well, how long has, has it been? It, it's been years, but you know, it, it works and this is how we deploy it. Nobody knew what the script does or exactly how it worked or what it did, but it was quote unquote the way they've been doing it. And you know, it was like, okay, we need, we need to take a step back and really think about what are the best practices you need to be putting in place? And we understand that you know, not everyone's a greenfield unless you're a startup or a brand new organization. We get that you got a lot of brownfield to deal with, but you've got to take a point where you say, look, we're going to start to implement best practices. We're going to start to implement consistent policies. And in fact, one way to look at that, one great way to look at it is we are defining policies in Azure that guess what? You're going to be able to deploy on premises through Arc. And to me, this is about providing now a consistency for your hybrid environment, whether it's on-prem, whether it's in your data center, whether it's in the cloud, whether it's you know Windows, whether it's Linux, that all of a sudden will make everybody's life better. So, and that's one of the ways I find that hybrid can make on-prem better is that the cloud can almost function as a management layer because in the past we might have something like. Well, we had operations manager, but we didn't have necessarily an easy yes. way of like a, a like a product called security manager, which would literally go out and assess your security configurations and tell you what was right and what's wrong. And I can see that with Arc, that one of the promises of Arc is the ability to basically take some a uh, security baseline like Stig, one of the Stigs, and say, right, we can assess your current configuration against uh, a particular Stig. And we can say where you're not compliant with the stig, but we can also then go and look through all of your logs and say, now this is why you might not want to turn this particular thing on. For example, it might go and look at, and I'm not sure that it does this, but it could go and look at your NTLM and say, well, you've got NTLM auditing. We're seeing that you're still using it. So we're not going to implement this recommendation that you turn off NTLM because if you do that, you're going to break this, this, and this, and this. But we can make these recommendations to you that you should go and do this, 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 and this so that you can then reach this new thing. And this is something that the cloud offers that we couldn't do easily on-prem because of the amount of legwork involved, where it can make recommendations that can literally say, 
hey, we want you to turn off NTLM. To turn off NTLM, you need to get a deal with this, 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 and this. And once you've deal with, dealt with this, you can level up your security and we'll even give you a nice little score to tell you how much you've improved it. Well, and think about systems management today and think about how people have been doing it for the last 10 or 20 years. They've been using operations manager. They've been using configuration manager. They've been using, you know, system center has a, a major, major footprint in enterprises around the world. But as much as system center is awesome, don't get me wrong, there's also a place where people realize that the cloud can do so many things so much better. Um, one of the challenges that I have run into for, for large, really large organizations for years has been, they'll say, Jeff, I've got multiple data centers. I've got multiple sites. Maybe it's branch offices, maybe it's data centers, maybe it's guys that are on the road, all sorts of different environments, but guess what? It's changing. And most importantly, I just want to be able to understand what I have in my estate. What does my inventory look like? What is my asset management? look like and honestly if you ask an IT pro you know one of the biggest challenges that they have is just trying to understand what they have so that they can manage it better and today you know you look at system center and you know within a domain or within a site hey it's it can be pretty awesome it's when you start realizing wait a minute I got multiple sites I got multiple branches I've got multiple people trying to do this and I've I've worked you know I've chatted with customers who said look we we're working actually try and put all of these together and we want to create this aggregate view that shows us everything that we've got oh and wouldn't it be great if we could actually you know start to plug in other things like event logs and monitoring and health and all of these things but at the very basic can i just see all of the assets i have literally every server every storage device every endpoint device and every user managed device and actually see all of those things and there's, there's a stat out there um, huge. i can't remember who collected it that said about 30 percent of all server workloads are comatose and one of the reasons for that is that monitoring is just so so um, unable to see everything. So that even if you've got everything plugged in, you're not necessarily sure what everything's doing. And one of the, the advantages of the cloud is once you can get it, or once you can put the haystack up here, you can then use the power of cloud to start finding the needles in the haystack in a way that you couldn't do it down here, where you were just worried about whether or not you had visibility. And there's visibility and then there's recognizing what you're actually looking at and the cloud is excellent because it's got all of that ai and machine learning to actually yes. recognize what it's looking at not just making sure that you've actually got visibility and I, think, and I don't oh sorry go ahead sonia i think look i think some of that also comes from the fact that uh, our cloud environments are a little bit more distributed in terms of who's spinning up those resources right I and mean, at least when i was an it pro if a new server got putting into the environment it was my it team that had to order the hardware and build it and get it provisioned in the racks or at least get it provisioned in the, the data center that was hosting it for us and one of the first things that we would do is make sure that we had an, an agent on it right there are a lot of third-party systems out there for deploying agents to various operating systems to try and give you that one central dashboard especially if you've got um, you know environments in, in sort of different states and different domains mm -hmm. but with the cloud now we, we're, it's not just the IT people that are putting resources in the cloud. We've got developers that want to self-provision um, those kind of resources, whether or not they're ISVMs or whether they're serverless or all of the other tools that they've got access to in the cloud now that they're spinning up under my subscriptions that I'm now going to need to be responsible for, not only from a cost perspective, but from a security perspective and an operations and performance perspectives. Um, and I think the the cool part about that, though, is that we, we've kind of saw that that was going to be a thing. and We counteracted that by wrapping this policy engine around it to turn around and go, you know what, we can actually put some controls about what people can provision in the cloud, sizes of, of storage accounts or VMs, where they can put them in terms of location and get some really good visibility across all of those resources so that you can start managing with the policy. And like you said, Azure Arc for Service is the icing on the cake to be able to go, look, you don't want to manage two separate environments in two different ways. You don't want to be managing your cloud servers and your resources this way and then your on-prem servers in the other way. And so what we're seeing now in terms of that compatibility, that Azure Arc um, for service agent being able to bring the visibility of those on-prem machines into the Azure portal and have them managed by the, the same sort of policy set, it's just going to make life so much simpler for organizations that are going to be running hybrid environments for the long term. And and this goes to one of the core compelling things that customers are telling me that they see as part of their move to the cloud, which is, wait, wait a minute, 
Now I have literally a management plane that I can train, I can understand, I can build. My next generation skill set becomes the Azure management plane. It's, it's, it's log analytics, it's monitoring, it's update, it's ARC, it's policy. And guess what? I can now all of a sudden, I have a way to manage all of my organization's resources. I don't have to worry, you know, is it in a domain? Is it not in a domain? Is it Windows? It's Linux? We handle it all. Okay, so now I have a way to enforce policy, enforce update management. I can actually see my assets. So solving one of that, 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 that fundamental challenge that people had with System Center, which was how do I bring in all of these different system centers from different organizations, or from, from different locations and different offices, and actually kind of federate that data so that I could start to figure out how to make sense of it. Don't worry about any of that. You know, archify your resources. You see it, it all lights up now in Azure. And on top of that now, you know, as you bring in more things, they all appear here. And most importantly, think about that management plane. And this is why I think for IT pros, it's so critical that this becomes the next tool in their toolkit, which is because it's today, fine. System Center, I've got to update System Center. I've got to manage the life cycle of System Center. You know, there's a new version of OpsMan, there's a new version of System Center, there's a new version of Config Manager. On-prem, I've got to do all of those updates. In the cloud, we handle it all for you. What you are focused on as an IT pro is your ability to deliver to your organization, not just keeping the management plane up and running. So that's an important way to, and it's, it's interesting when we were introduced to the concept of cloud, it was almost marketed and I use that word deliberately, as a replacement for on-prem. But I think the reality, and especially for IT pros who are very practical focused, is that it's a complement to on-prem, that it's not a replacement. I mean, there's certain things. There's um, one of the, the things that I'm seeing a lot of customers talk about is actually using the cloud as a development environment and then once the workloads have reached a level of maturity, actually bringing them back on-prem. We had a discussion with uh, one of our other presenters where he was talking about a lot of development of Kubernetes technologies and Kubernetes clusters was done in the cloud where they could rapidly iterate. But once it got to a certain level of maturity, it was like, right, we're not gonna run it up down there. We actually wanna run it on Azure Stack HCI. Yes. But we're happy to play with it at the beginning up here because we can do whatever. But once we actually know what it looks like and we've built it and we've designed it and it's good, right, we're actually going to run it in one of our boxes. So when any, when, and I think that it got people a little offside um, when they were talking about it being a replacement because especially for IT pros, we've seen a lot of technologies proposed that have fizzled out. And one of the things an IT pro has to be about their workloads is inherently a little conservative because you don't want to sell your business on a platform that's going to disappear in five years' time. So you want to know that it's got it's going to, going to get some legs underneath it. And whereas if you're understanding it as a complement, you can then suddenly understand, oh, my gosh, I can see where this actually will stick around because it's making things a whole lot better. It's not just oh, this is a different way to run VMs. Instead of going and throwing it into a hosting yes. provider, I can throw it into that. I'm seeing, oh, this management layer. And there's, you know, there's pros and cons. There's, you can go and put your management layer up here and it's really good for a lot of people. But there's also a lot of dials and switches that keep changing that make it a bit more challenging to keep, to become an expert on because you're always dealing with sort of a moving target. Whereas if you've got something that you deploy down here and you become an you know, you spend five years on it, you're going to really know the in and out of your management plan because it has stayed stable. And, and that is, I completely agree with everything you're saying. And that's one of the things that actually customers have told me many times. The reason why we've gone to Azure is number one, you've proven Microsoft, you know how to deliver this stuff on prem. This stuff is going to stay around. Sure, we're moving a bunch of stuff into the cloud but we know it's all, all going to get connected. And because we know that you know how to run on-prem, we know that you know how to run on cloud, we also know that putting all these together, there's no one that should know better hybrid than Microsoft. And, and Microsoft you know, can have that conversation 
mm-hmm. that our competitors can't. Where we say, you know what, you run it where it suits you. You don't have to run everything in the cloud because not everything should run in the cloud. There's some yes. things that should run on prem, and there's some things that should run on the cloud. Our cloud first competitors might be, well, we don't want you to run on prem because we can't. We're not making any money out of that. Um, we want you to run everything with us, and it might not make sense for you, even though it makes sense to them. Whereas I think, and I can't speak for you know the corporate strategy. What we're trying to do with hybrid is say, do it where it makes sense for you. I, I'm going to share my screen. I know I was trying to I was trying to keep this conversational and not bring up slides, but I, I've got to bring up I've got to bring up one here. So when it when it comes to when it comes to complementary, this is one of my absolute favorite better together stories. And this to me, if you're an IT pro and you haven't at least looked at this, you're, you're just way behind the ball. This to me is such an obvious hybrid cloud story. And the benefits are so huge. It's just, it's right there for the taking. So I mean, as your file sync is better than cheesecake. It is absolutely. I, I, I cannot tell you how many conversations I've had with customers about Azure File Sync, and literally the meeting comes to a complete stop where where like people raise their hand and start going, "When did this? When did this come out? How come I've never heard of this?" Real problems that everybody's got with mucking out their file servers and replication. So but first of all, that's the thing. Our, our IT pros they. They, they light up when they get those little nuggets of things that they make the connection about how it makes their on-prem world better. I mean, as soon as they learn about something like custom band password lists back into Azure AD or dynamic thresholds for monitoring that you get with Azure Monitor monitoring your on-prem servers, they're like, I didn't realize that the cloud could do that for my on-prem environment. Yes, exactly right. I did not realize that you were Microsoft, you were getting you are actually evaluating threats that are happening on the other side of the globe. You're actually updating Defender in real time. You're making those changes and deploying those out. And by the time it gets to my side of the globe, you've already put in a a, a mitigation in Defender. That is the power of the cloud, where we can do things because we are at planetary scale you know, we can drive that scale to everyone and give you tremendous benefit. And also, again, it goes back to the fact that we've been doing on-premises, you know, whether you're a small, medium business to the largest Fortune 500 enterprises, globals out there, we know what those challenges are and we wanna make sure that we're driving the right solutions. And to me, this is this is one of my favorite because I've spoken to so many happy Azure File Sync customers. And quite literally, it all started because at the end of the day, every customer has a file server. <laughs> you know, everybody has a file. It's why it's why servers f- first started. It's why servers are, are 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 existent and it's the number one use case. It's because I need to share data. Now, I will always have the SharePoint guys coming to me and go, "Well, Jeff, SharePoint, I don't get me wrong, love my SharePoint." SharePoint's awesome. SharePoint made file servers so much, much better. Took it to the next level. Don't get me wrong. But file servers are still everywhere. And since the dawn of file servers, no one has ever said, wow, I just bought a file server and I will never need more storage than what I've got today. Nobody's ever said those words. You know? No, because what happens is, I mean, there's even like a mathematical thing where is that a file is created and then it's got a certain lifespan before it's never going to be touched again. But we don't know easily what the probability is. There's certain files that if they haven't been touched for 90 days, there's a 99% chance they're never going to be touched again. But there's that one file and everybody knows yes. because it'll be the file that you've removed from the file server and then you, you know, someone comes to you and says, oh, look, we've got that Excel spreadsheet from like five years ago that we need now for an audit. Where is it? And you're sitting there going, um, yeah, we ship that tape off. <laughs> well, and how, how many IT pros have created, you know, they have the Dropbox for everybody in the organization or an apartment, and it's always running out. So you're sending the nag mail to please, hey, clean out your Dropbox, get rid of the old stuff. And everybody's got like, you know, you know, everybody in the org has the same copy of the same PowerPoint deck 20 times over. And, you know, this is a real, real world solution 
that quite honestly is doing just gangbusters in terms of um, you know the amount of storage that Azure File Sync um, is 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 hosting on Azure because number one it just is simple and just works and to me you know you start with fundamentally what is this about well number one you know multi-site sync it's for those customers that say hey guess what you know what, I, I wanna be able to easily share files between different locations, and I have lots of things that I wanna share between you know, headquarters and my multiple branches. And you know, whether it's user data, whether it's server data, whether it's you know, all of that, it, it's you know, file sync is there. But to me, the critical one is this, cloud tiering. This is just gold. I mean, think about it. You buy, a, you, you buy a file server, you set it up, you put a bunch of storage in there, and it's out of storage. What do you do? Oh, I got to go buy some more storage. I've got to figure out, you know, how did, did I max it out? Do I have any more slots in my server? Do I plug it in externally? Do I got to buy some sort of device? How do I deal with running out of storage? It's the most fundamental problem. And here, Azure File Sync just makes this, no, we solved the problem for you. We basically sit- And something sit that we don't do with OneDrive or OneDrive for Business is because mm -hmm. the cloud hearing here either says, hey, what you've got is you've said, leave me this amount of free space on the volume or yes. just automatically tier files that are, haven't been touched for a certain amount of time. Whereas if you're using one of these sort of these desktop clients, you've got to sit there manually and go, oh, don't keep this on my device. So eventually you've still got to, do, go, and, got to go and do that manual process. And, and, and it's the automatic part of this is what makes this so fantastic. Because literally you set up a share and, 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 and I love the simplicity of this solution, which is look, I've got a share and you basically say, how much of this is gonna be free? So if it's a hundred gigabytes and you're gonna say, guess what? Or forget hundred gigabytes, you know, 10 terabytes, 10 terabytes. How much of this is gonna be free? Well, keep 25% of it free. That means the moment it's over that, you know what? It's just gonna tear into the cloud. And what it means is, it means that that file server on-prem becomes a hot cache. And so all of the things that people are actually touching and manipulating and accessing is running right there locally on that server on-prem. It's all fast, it's all zippy, it's all good. And that stuff that you haven't touched in a long time, guess what? It's automatically tiered to Azure when you need it click on the file it looks like it's right there there's 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 a file there you click on it it downloads it from azure and the I nice thing the brilliance of it because it makes it transparent to the user the user yes. has no idea whatsoever that anything's changed and yes. when they don't know what's changed and if their cheese hasn't been moved they're happy with it whereas exactly. if they had to go in and you had to have a manual process of click this button to request this file to be restored you'd be like nah not wanting that at all that, that's not yes. very good. But if they don't know about it, excellent. It's automatic. It's transparent. All you have to do is set the tiering policy. I mean, that that is what, you know, transparent hybrid should look like. And so the cloud tiering is what makes this gold. And to me, the other features are just, wow, this is just, you know, icing on the cake. So cloud tiering's got you covered. Then, of course, you've got backup. And what's great about this is all is because guess what? This is going into the cloud. Guess what? I can now just use Azure Backup to automatically back this up. And of course, I can do all of the encryption on the backup. And also, this gives me a DR story. So this really is a comprehensive storage, hybrid storage uh, solution that we're giving. So if that file server goes down, Guess what? That's okay. The files are still available. They're all up in the cloud. Guess what? Plug in my new server, set up sync, and there we go. And so and if to a me, file gets corrupted, there uh -huh. you can just restore it in the cloud and then it uh -huh. replicates down to all your endpoints. Uh -huh. So this is an example of how I look at I look at moving forward, how IT pros should be thinking about the next set of tools that they need to be thinking about. What are these hybrid tools? What is this management plane in Azure that I need to understand? How do I integrate Arc into my, into my workflow so that I have a consistency of management, I have a consistency of policy, and I'm improving the service I'm providing to the organization? I mean, think about it. I've had, I've, I've, I've spoken to customers that had a 20 terabyte file server 
that they thought was going to last them years and years and years that was full. And I've, and they've basically come back to us and they've said, yeah, actually our 20 terabyte file server is effectively over a hundred terabytes now because of all of the file sync work that Azure File Sync is doing. And the fact that we don't have to manage the moving of storage to the cloud that's an automatic process has made our lives so much better and has made us so much more productive. Because we're talking about folks with huge data sets. Uh, we've worked with folks in, that have, you know, that are in Hollywood that have been producing videos and producing trailers for movies and stuff like that. And for them, just the data manipulation and moving all of this stuff around, the fact that this is automatic is an absolute lifesaver because they would have to have people just there to manage the data because you know they would go through it so quickly. So this to me is you know one fantastic example of of the work that hybrid can do uh, to to make you know everyone's life much better. And as I think about the stuff here on the right, the centrally managing from Azure, I'm seeing this start to grow in importance. You know, when we started Azure, it was interesting that the stuff on the left, don't get me wrong, the stuff on the left is still critically important, but this is where, you know, this is where customers started with us. They said, you know what, Jeff, we want to extend into Azure. And it was, you know, it was kind of a conservative take, which was, look, we know home is our on-prem environment and we feel good about this and we're going to use Azure as an extension. So for VM replication, for example, Azure Site Recovery, you know, do that, or Azure File Sync to extend my storage, or use um, Cloud Witness, for example, for my failover clusters to provide me quorum and stuff like that. That's where it started. What we see right now is the right-hand side is the part where customers are going, wait a minute, we think that there is so much value in here because of the fact that, like, like I said before, and I don't mean to sound like a broken record, but the management plane is there Microsoft is managing the management plane for me. I don't have to deal with any of the lifecycle management. I mean, I just think about, you know, again, when we release a new version of a system center or any enterprise product, guess what? They're going to give you a bunch of training. They're going to show you how to migrate your data to the new platform. We handle all of this for you. And we just deliver new features. We just light them up for you so that you can concentrate on delivering value back to the organization. So, I think the, um, Azure File Sync's an easy gateway drug into the cloud. And I think that really the next one for a lot of IT pros who are, are, are very on-prem centric is Azure Update Management. Because Azure Update Management's uh, value proposition is everybody's got the WSUS server on-prem that you sit there and you go, okay, it kind of does what I need it to do. But if you've got multiple sites and WSUS doesn't give you an audit of what's missing on uh, particular machines, and then suddenly by plugging things into Azure Update Management, you can manage updates across your Windows and your Linux systems. But it's very much that paradigm of your management layers in the cloud because you log on, into the Azure portal and you say, right, I want to run this update deployment and then bang, 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 you've suddenly got a group of computers that are compliant with a set of updates. And I think that when I know I'm talking to people about hybrid and what's the value proposition of hybrid, I start with Azure File Sync. That's solving one problem that you've got. Azure Update Management is solving another problem that's pressing for you right at the moment. Yes, absolutely, yes. And, and better scale, better resilience, better visibility that you're getting through update management, and then Azure Monitor. Azure Monitor to me is, to me, you know, I look at, I look at one of the most popular features of System Center, it's been Operations Manager for so long. And I don't, by the way, I keep mentioning System Center, I don't want anybody thinking I'm bagging on System Center that I don't like some System Center, or that System Center is going anywhere, because by the way, for those customers that are completely have some of these, you know, air-gapped environments, guess what? That's what they're using to manage it. They're absolutely using System Center. So there's plenty of and cases where System Center continues to be adopted and continues to grow in those scenarios. And but there's we'll, certainly yeah. cases where you can uh, integrate System Center with this management plane. So you can have Operations Manager where you've got all your management packs exactly. that are collecting certain sets of data and then using that as a funnel to shunt it up to Azure. So it's not, again, 
The cloud is complementary to on-prem. It's not a replacement for on-prem. Yes. And the fact that we're also building kind of a community up there as well. So policy is a good example of this. In Azure policy, we actually have a bunch of policy built into Azure so that when a lot of people don't realize this, when you deploy a VM in Azure IaaS, there's a whole bunch of policy we, we, we help you out with that we automatically include to provide a consistent environment. And there's a whole bunch of policies that are already there. So for example, you may say, hey, I'm working in this type of vertical or this type of vertical where these types of policies are recommended or some of these policies are required. And you can literally say, well, then I want that policy profile. Well, now we're in a world where you can say, hey, by the way, that's not just what's happening in Azure, but that's also what I'm deploying on-prem. And so that can be Azure Arc for services. And by the way, that can be Azure Arc running in a VMware VM, that can be running in a Hyper-V VM, that could be running on physical. And so again, as an IT pro, think about what we're doing here. We're giving you the next set of tools for your toolbox. These are the things that you should be learning. These are the things that you should be comfortable with because you know, like like knowing Active Directory, like knowing System Center, you know, guess what? These are gonna be the next generation of tools that are gonna be important on your resume, they're important on your CV. And really, there's so many ways that you can plug into the community, learn more, heck, put your own policies in there. You may have a policy, guess what? I thought of something that no one's thought of, please add it to there. Give us your feedback. Let us know how, you know, are, are there things that would be useful to you? Maybe you're in a very niche vertical or something like that. You want to add your, your two cents into? We'd love to have it because this allows us to better figure out what are, you know, what are, what are the right consistent policies that we can help folks with. So I just want to angle this conversation back to the SMB space for a moment because that's yes. you know, a, an area that I spent a long time in and as a managed service provider. And I know that Pierre has recorded a great session about Azure Lighthouse. And I've been watching with interest the um, capabilities of Azure Lighthouse grow alongside with the Azure Arc capabilities. You can certainly see that the roadmap for that is very much looking like expanding that management plane over multiple different environments. So if you haven't taken a look at Azure Lighthouse, what that does is it gives us the ability to get visibility of different Azure environments um, through the one Azure portal plane, and that includes PowerShell and the CLI for running your commands. But now, if you put yourself in the shoes of a managed service provider, instead of having to log into different environments with different credentials, or it's a similar to a form of delegated access control where I can now get access to different customer environments from this one control plane, get visibility of them all on the same page and manage them all at the same time. And it's controlled by the customer insofar as if at any time they want to see the activity of what I've been doing in their environment or they want to revoke my access completely, they have the control to do that too. The interesting part is seeing where Azure Arc is fitting into that now. And so not only are you getting visibility of your customer's cloud environments, but you're getting visibility of their on-prem environments and no matter where they have those servers or their data sources, we're seeing more compatibility through Azure Arc to get visibility of those in the same plane. And I think it's just a, it's just a great story that the management tools that we're talking about, this plane inside Azure for controlling things, isn't just applicable to the, the large end of town, to the enterprises. Azure Lighthouse is interesting in that it's also got some great use case scenarios for larger enterprises that themselves are running multiple Azure tenancies. And so outside of the MSB space, that's a whole different use case for a lot of our multinational customers. But if I'm starting out my IT career, if I'm working in a smaller business, Yes. Those skills that I'm going to pick up learning things like Azure Monitor, Azure Policy, Azure Sentinel, and how Azure Arc integrates in that control plane, they're going to suit me whether or not I'm working on one customer that's got five servers, whether I'm working on 10 customers that have got one or two servers each, or when I step into the enterprise world, if I want a career change and I want to go and work for a much larger company, hey, guess what? It's still Azure Policy, Azure Monitor, Azure Sentinel, yes. and those tools are just so ubiquitous across your career as being a new cloud foundational skill for our IT pros. Oh, Sonia, thank you so much for bringing this up. <laughs> yeah, no, this you hit the nail right on the head. Kudos to you. So, thank you. you. You know, you're you're so right. Uh, we, you know, 
it's easy to easy to forget. You know, you talk. We talk a lot about enterprises and large organizations, and sometimes it's easy to. I don't. Heaven forbid, overlook our 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 tremendous customers in the SMB space, um, because there are just so many of them. There are millions of them, um, and you're you're absolutely right. A lot of these small medium businesses, they work with partners that help manage their environments. And if you're one of those, you know, organizations that is, is servicing, you know, lots of different customers and they're all using Azure, you know, it's important that we build a solution that allows you to manage all of those different customers, do it securely, of course, because you're talking, you know, multi-tenant environment here. You may have to deal with different licensing models. You may have, you know, ESPEA, CSPs, you may have pay as you go. I mean, oh my gosh, you know, between licensing business models, tenancy and all of these things, you know, it can be kind of challenging. Mm -hmm. And at the same time for the customer, you know, the customer, you know, just because they're a small medium business doesn't mean, you know, that they don't want to see what, you know, what, how, how, you know, what work is being done by the partner. So being able to, you know, delegate management, delegate permissions, you know, audit the work that they're doing, totally get it. And you bring up an excellent point. And that's what, you know, Azure Lighthouse is designed to do was, you know, Customers, you know, obviously they, you know, they choose a partner that they they trust and and they and and you know they expect to support them. But at the same time, you also want to, you know, it's it's a two way street, and you do want to be able to check in. Hey, did did those changes I request happen? You know, you know, can 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 both sides, you know, audit and and see what's going on. And most importantly, can can the business partner, you know, securely manage different environments and different locations and do it in a way that makes everyone happy. And you're right, Azure Lighthouse is a huge initiative by us to make sure that we have solutions that scale all the way down to really small businesses that, you know what, they they want to focus on providing their service to their organization, um, however big or however small they are, and they may have a partner that that handles the IT for them. And you know what, they don't want to think about Azure. They, they have a Microsoft trusted uh, cloud solution provider that does it for them. So the, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Another thing to think about to pivot yet again is that management isn't just cloud down. One of the things that's very important for people that are Windows Server people is the new management tools that allow them to manage parts of their infrastructure up. I'm talking specifically about Windows Admin Center and all of the, the hybrid capabilities that are being lit up in Windows Admin Center and that really if you're going to take a step into this hybrid world, that you really need to be starting to use those tools there to connect up, not just to come down. And that hybrid's a story about it, maybe it works for you that way or maybe it works for you that way. Yeah. So Admin Center is super near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been begging and pleading for uh, Widmo's Admin Center for a very, very, very long time. And I have to tell you, it has been so gratifying to see the customer response. Uh, we It's only been out just, just over three years. We know that there are millions and millions of servers under management with Windows Admin Center. And for those folks who haven't you know, played with it yet, please, Go download Windows Admin Center right now. If you played with it a while ago, but you haven't touched it in a while, trust me, it's changed dramatically. Why? Because it's been changing dramatically since the very first time we released it three years ago. Um, Admin Center has become this really go-to tool, um, not only for you know helping you manage your servers on-prem, in Azure, in the cloud, connecting to create these uh, these hybrid environments for example the azure file sync that we talked about one of the things that you know i remember talking to the azure file sync team was guys this should be automatic i should be able to click 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 through you know and admin center will automatically configure my file server without me ever having to touch the file server and it does exactly that you use admin center connect it to your file server you don't need to rdp into it it's all communicating remotely it'll install the agent It'll configure the resources with Azure. It'll take your subscription information. You literally walk through it. You type in your Azure policy and boom, you're done. And you never literally logged into the server and touched a thing. And I so was um, doing a demo yesterday that was really cool in that it was storage replica. And storage mm -hmm. replica replicates, you know, one volume to another volume. 
But there's in Windows Admin Center, you go storage replica and it goes, do you want to replicate to another server or do you want to replicate to an Azure VM? You click Azure VM, it spins up the VM for you. You never have to go into the console and then suddenly it's replicating your volume from on-prem to Azure. So again, there's a disaster recovery that's click, click, click down here that uses all the hybrid technology up here to make yes. on-prem better. Yes, and Azure Site Recovery was actually one of the very first hybrid capabilities we built in. I remember um, we demoed this many ignites ago, but literally, you know, select a VM, click on replicate, and boom, you're replicating in Azure in like two or three clicks. And, you know, I, I say two or three clicks because we literally count clicks. You know, my goal is I always tell guys, uh, tell the team, it's got to be single digit clicks. If we get into over 10, it's taking too many. What, why is this taking so many clicks? You know, we got to keep that, you know, keep that number down, keep it, keep it simple, do everything that we need to do, but let's really make sure we have the, whole, the right actions we need there. And the team has, has nailed it. And we've continued to grow on our hybrid capabilities, whether it's creating an extended network, whether it's creating a site to site, a point to site um, VPN, whether it's a site to site replication, we've been adding more of these hybrid capabilities. And one other thing I want to point out about Admin Center is Admin Center has continued to grow in its functionality. When we launched Admin Center early on, it was, okay, it's to manage your Windows servers. Oh, then we added, by the way, we added the ability to do hybrid capabilities. Then we added the ability to deploy an Azure Stack HCI cluster. Um, you may not have realized it for our folks. So uh, this is something we just released literally in the last week. Um, there's an Azure IoT Edge plugin now in Admin Center. So now all of a sudden, what this will do is actually deploy a Linux container. Did, did Jeff just say Linux? <laughs> yes. It'll actually deploy a Linux container on Edge IoT. So I've had for years, I've had people go, well, Jeff, this only manages Windows Server, you know, doesn't manage Linux. And I said, well, we don't do anything to preclude that. We don't do anything to prevent it. There's nothing that limits, you know, we've actually made Admin Center as a pluggable console. Um, we just haven't built a Linux plugin because we're really super busy on the Windows Server stuff, the Azure Stack stuff, and the Edge stuff, and the hybrid stuff. Well, now this new Edge IoT actually deploys um, a, Linux container for Edge IoT. So that's in uh, that's in preview if people want to play with that. But it just shows you that Admin Center is also one of those tools you need in your toolbox. So you know, and I think that look, my my hope with it is that I eventually I can do everything that I could do in a console. So everything from Active Directory users and computers or an equivalent, and and then a version that does the hybrid version of that. So as your AD Connect all sits in there as well certificate services, um, wins server. Uh, oh, man. Arne, Arne, are you trying to kill MMC.exe? <laughs> yes, because eventually that's the only way that we eventually move on for it is for all of that functionality to be replicated so that I don't have to sit there and go, you know what, I need to do this tricky thing. I need to go up and spin up an MMC because I can do it all in admin centre or if I really want to, in PowerShell, but Admin Center allows me to do it quickly. PowerShell is if I want to repeat doing it. But what I want to eventually get to the point of doing is I would love to retire the Server Manager console and I would love to retire Microsoft Management consoles. Have them there, have them as optional features that I can add if I need them. But if I can do everything through WAC, my life is a lot better. Or, or an, I, I, yeah, for folks listening, Go back and listen to what Oren just said like three more times. Uh, <laughs> you, you, you know, I loved what you said there. You know, for easy to use, it's whack. If stuff I want to repeat, it's PowerShell. Yes, it's the right tool for the right problem. And every so often, someone will come onto my social feed on Twitter and, you know, complain that, you know, this, you know, needs more automation or why aren't you doing automation? I'm like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's this thing called PowerShell. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? You know, PowerShell's awesome. It's fantastic. And it's not PowerShell or Admin Center, okay? I'm not telling you to get rid of PowerShell and I'm not telling you to, you know, that you should always use PowerShell. Use the right tool, you know? And 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 those tools, you'll, you'll notice PowerShell Admin Center and the Azure console, the Azure portal, these are all complementary things. They yes. all fit in your toolbox. 
And that's what hybrid is. It's a complement to on-prem. It's not a replacement for on-prem. Absolutely. On and I Absolutely. think... I think if we'd um, talked about it that way 10 years ago, we would have had people a much more less less um, concerned about the cloud because some of the ways that it was talked about, it was talked about, we're going to replace you with the cloud. And it's like, no, that's not true at all. What the cloud is is right. going to give you a much bigger toolbox and much newer tools, but you're still going to be doing the same stuff. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and I, I keep telling people, like I... Uh, and in, fa in fact, I'll, I'll even say it now. Look, we're, you know, we released, we've been releasing, going back to the last 20 years, we've been releasing a Windows Server release every two to three years like clockwork. Every two to three years like clockwork, new version of Windows Server. Spoiler alert, that's going to happen again. We're going to release a new version of Windows Server within two to three years of the last one. Spoiler alert, we will after that. Spoiler alert, we will after that too. We will continue to do that because guess what? That's what the market demands. It's That's what we of, need. I, reports I, I, of the death of Windows Server have been greatly exaggerated. I know. I, right? It's hilarious. Like, <laughs> folks, I keep telling people, look, Windows Server is going to be shipping long after I retire, and I don't plan on retiring anytime soon. And what I look at is, look, we are our goal is to figure out to give you the, the right thing to solve the right problem. And Azure Stack HCI slots right into this as well. Um, Azure Stack HCI, you know, number one, hybrid is built in. Hybrid is first class. That that whole management console that we've been talking about with Azure Portal, Azure Stack HCI is a first class citizen right there in the Azure Portal. And every time I demo this and I show people, like you can just literally see their mouths drop to go, wait a minute. Yeah, you just registered Azure Stack with HCI, and now it appears in the Azure portal, and it, that's all. I didn't need to download any agents. I didn't need to install any nonsense. No, it's just built into the product, and now I have insights from the cloud. And if I want to deploy Kubernetes on it, if I want to deploy Azure Monitor, if I want to deploy Azure Se Security Center, deploy Azure Policy, it's all right there. And it, it, it's just, it's just, it's a, it's a different way of thinking. It's just a different way of thinking because. Again, we most of us come from an on-prem world moving to the cloud, but once you've seen that, guess what? The, the cloud can do all of these things for your on-prem world, and it's this bi-directional cloud goodness, it's, it's fantastic for everyone. Well, I think that we've probably reached a, a great point to uh, end this conversation. So thank you very much, Jeff, for your time and everything that we've talked about. It's been wonderful. Um, you are Sonia. quite welcome. Yeah, that, that was amazing. We, we could carry on much longer, but uh, we will let our viewers uh, go back to see the other great sessions that we have in this event. We know you've all got limited time. And if you enjoyed this conversation, come and tell us your thoughts. Do you agree with us? There are some things you disagree with. Come and tell us what you think at aka.ms forward slash ops 107 dash chat. That is the social chat for this particular session. And if you're interested in any of the other sessions from this event, come and find us at aka.ms forward slash IT Ops Talks. There you'll be able to see all of the other great technical talks that we've had in this event as well. Jeff, thank you so much for your time. It's always a pleasure. And I hey, just love thing, that we were you. able to, um, to have this, this chat about all of these topics that are so important for our IT pros. A huge thank you to both of you. And most importantly, a huge thank you to all of our, our users, our customers, our friends out there. Um, just we, we, you know, we want to make sure we're delivering the right thing for you guys to be successful. And uh, we appreciate all your support. Keep the feedback keep coming. Try out Azure. Try out uh, Windows Admin Center. Download Azure Stack HCI. Lots more to come. we got a busy 2021 ahead. Bring it on. Thanks, Jeff.